John Duffy's wife watched in horror as he transformed into a brooding monster, whose gaze, akin to a laser beam, entranced the distressed victims. The laser gaze killer. That's how state prosecutor Anthony Hooper referred to the defendant in his opening statement. The media promptly adopted this fitting moniker, engaging in a competition to detail the biographical facets of the maniacal murderer. During his childhood, John Duffy served as a church altar boy, but his inclination for violence led him down a criminal path. By the time of his trial in 1988, this young man, at the age of 30, had already spent two years incarcerated. John Duffy was suspected in at least three cases of aggravated murder, with two others yet unproven. He epitomized the vilest kind of sexual offender. Insatiable, brutal, and utterly merciless. John Duffy was born into a sizable Catholic Irish family, comprising six children. He relocated to England while still young, attended school, and subsequently worked at various jobs. In 1980, he wed Margaret Mitchell, a short, overweight woman, though their marriage was far from harmonious. The cruelty Duffy inflicted upon his wife eventually put the authorities on his trail. The couple resided in an apartment on Barlow Road in Kilburn, where John's transformation into a monster occurred before his wife's eyes. Initially perceiving him as a kind and gentle person, Margaret was confronted with his monstrous side. His deranged gaze seemed to penetrate, instilling terror. Margaret Mitchell later testified during the trial, the handsome man I married turned into a raging monster with incredibly eerie eyes. He made awful statements, claiming he enjoyed abusing people and that violence was natural for any man. Duffy was acutely aware of his diminutive stature, approximately 160 centimeters, and sought to compensate by enrolling in karate and other martial arts classes. He frequented a sports center near his residence, devoting three evenings a week to strengthening his muscles and refining various grappling and kicking techniques. John Duffy dedicated several hours daily to reading books, favoring works that glorified the exploits of the Nazis, violence, and cruelty. He exhibited a peculiar fondness for the Anarchist's Handbook, a manual of terrorism featuring diverse murder methods. From this source, he gleaned insights into the importance of covering his tracks to ensure the success of his crimes. This strategic thinking allowed him to evade police detection despite his numerous atrocities. During the initial years of his marriage, Duffy worked as a railway carpenter. He meticulously studied the London and surrounding area railway networks, employing this knowledge to skillfully evade crime scenes. The railroad became an integral part of his modus operandi, enabling him to disappear swiftly after his heinous acts. Margaret Mitchell, who had separated from Duffy in 1986, provided testimony at the trial recounting their shared history. For the first two years, we led a fairly normal life. However, when we decided to have a child and learned that he was infertile, our lives changed dramatically. Strangely, this transformation manifested in our sexual life. He suddenly developed an urge to restrain me before we engaged in intercourse. John particularly relished my resistance. If I didn't resist or protest, his interest waned. The more I resisted, the more aroused he became. He would sometimes bring home videos depicting gory scenes, blood everywhere. He seemed to derive pleasure from the entire horrifying spectacle. A psychiatric assessment indicated, Duffy harbored a deep-seated hatred for women, blaming them for his infertility. This hatred translated into violent assaults against women. According to police records, Duffy's first recorded crime occurred in June 1982 near Hampstead Station in conjunction with an accomplice. A 24-year-old woman was forcibly taken to an abandoned building, bound, and gagged. She became the inaugural victim in a series of 27 attacks. The authorities attributed all these incidents to John Duffy, observing that some were solo acts, while others involved an accomplice. During the investigation of his initial rape, police conjectured that the assailant likely fled the scene via a London-bound train. This method of escape later became a hallmark a signature of the rapist. In 1985, Duffy escalated to murder. The catalyst was an unexpected encounter. While awaiting trial for assaulting his wife, he spotted the woman he had previously raped. She didn't recognize him, but he decided not to take any chances. His twisted mind concluded that all his future victims must remain forever silent. When Duffy targeted his next victim, he often donned a railway worker's uniform, concealed a folding knife with a razor-sharp blade, and carried a specific rape kit, 
that would ultimately serve as damning evidence against him. This kit included matches, twine, or cloth, and a device known as a Spanish winch used to strangle his chosen victims. Before committing his initial murder, Duffy had already come under police scrutiny. A law enforcement operation codenamed STAG compiled a database of known sex offenders in Britain. Duffy was included in this list, not by his name, but labeled as the Rapist, since rape had sparked the inception of Operation STAG. 27 days after surviving the excitement at Hendon Court and deciding not to take any chances, Duffy snuffed out the first human life. On December 29, 1985, he accosted Alison Day, a 19-year-old blonde woman on a train from Upminster to Hackney Wick, but Duffy forced her to get off early. Threatening her with a knife and foul swear words, he dragged Allison into a garage, raped and strangled her with a Spanish winch. Then, after attaching a weight to her body, he dumped her corpse in the river. They couldn't find Allison for 17 days, and time had done its work. All the evidence was gone. The only thing the police found was a few fibers of fabric from a railroad uniform. Employees of Scotland Yard did not immediately connect this case with the crime recorded during the Operation Deer, and although the corpse of the girl was found in the river near the railroad bed, against combining these two cases into one was a very strong argument. The rapist has never killed before. Nevertheless, there was speculation that the suspect and the murderer were one and the same person. At the same time, a 15-year-old schoolgirl, Martha Tambeezer, was murdered. Marchie was the daughter of a wealthy Dutch industrialist who had come to England. On that day, Marchie was returning home on her bicycle on a path along the railroad tracks. Duffy suddenly attacked her, dragged her to a vacant lot and tying her hands behind her back, raped her, then strangled her with his Spanish winch. He then burned the lower part of her body to destroy traces of semen. But without wanting to, he still left evidence. He broke the girl's cervical vertebrae with a blow that only martial arts practitioners can master. The killer left a barely recognizable footprint next to the body and a piece of Swedish-made rope. Then another rape occurred. This time the victim was a 14-year-old girl whose life Duffy spared. Her testimony during the trial left no one indifferent. She was crying all the time for the horror of the experience still lingered in her mind. Here's what she said. I was standing at a bus stop when a man in a railroad worker's uniform with a hood over his head approached me. He held a knife to me and dragged me into the bushes, threatening to slit my throat if I resisted and screamed. I couldn't even move. Then he put his arms around me like we were a couple in love, but he still held the knife near my neck. I thought he was about to kill me. Before he raped me, he said, you'll feel better if you do it right. When it was over, he seemed satisfied. I was in shock and didn't understand at all what was going on. I thought he wanted to slit my throat or something. In May, another murder occurred in which Duffy was charged. At the trial at the Old Bailey, at the judge's insistence, the offender was acquitted due to lack of evidence. The murder in which John Duffy was acquitted caused widespread public outcry across the country. Anne Locke, age 29, was a cheerful, happily married woman who worked as a secretary for the weekend television company in London. She was murdered in May 1986, after returning from a wedding trip. Her killer dragged her into a dimly lit part of a park behind a railroad track, tied her up, and gagged her with a stocking. The body could not be found for three months. Six days before Mrs. Locke's body was found, police questioned Duffy as one of the suspects. He was included in a group codenamed Menzied because his blood was found on the body of Marcha Tamser. Detectives from London, Surrey, and Hertfordshire counties joined forces to conduct a large-scale search and compiled a list of 5,000 suspected sex offenders identified in Operation Deer. The dedicated team used a computer to analyze the 5,000 cases according to the following parameters. Detailed description of the offenders, age, and methods of attack. Prof. David Cantor, a leading psychologist at the University of Sarai. Help it police recreate a psychological profile of the suspect. He also suggested that the murderous rapist lived in the London area, emphasizing that he was somehow connected to the railroad. All the data was then entered into a computer. 1999. Men whose psychological profiles fitted the pattern were given numbers and interviewed by police officers. John Duffy was registered as number 1505. If he hadn't abused his wife, his name would never have been entered into the computer system. 
Duffy turned out to be a master liar. For the night Allison Day was attacked, he came up with a plausible alibi. He also managed to convince officers that he wasn't sweating profusely. The fact is, several rape victims had indicated just that. But Duffy replied that he only sweats in moments of extreme stress. The police were not entirely satisfied with his answers. But there was no clue, no evidence to link Duffy's behavior in interviews to the attacks.